Host defense mechanisms involving antibodies in B-cells are called humoral immunity. When a naive B-cell is activated upon encountering its antigen, it proliferates and differentiates into memory and effector cells. The effector cells are called plasma cells, and these plasma cells secrete large numbers of antibody molecules, each with the same unique antigen binding specificity as the parental B-cell. The secreted antibodies act in a variety of ways to inactivate pathogens and toxins. Your goals for learning are to describe the basic structure and function of an antibody, to compare the functions of the different antibody classes, to describe how antibodies cause the destruction or inactivation of pathogens or their toxins, to describe events in B cell activation, including the role of helper T cells and events in the germinal center, to compare and contrast active and passive humoral immunity. Here's what you need to know. The mechanisms of innate internal host defenses, including phagocytosis, the role of complement, and opsonization. The structure of a lymph node. The common features of B and T lymphocytes. The maturation process of positive and negative selection of lymphocytes. To see definitions of terms, click the bold red words. Antibodies can be found on the plasma membrane of B lymphocytes where they act as the B cell antigen receptors. Antibodies can also be secreted into the extracellular fluids where they are also known as immunoglobulins or gamma globulins. These secreted antibodies make up a substantial fraction of the proteins found in blood plasma. Antibodies are large complex proteins made up of four subunits. Click the antibody to build a simplified model. An antibody consists of two main polypeptide building blocks, a heavy chain and a light chain. Click a heavy chain. Click a light chain. Notice that the antibody molecule is symmetrical. The two large subunits on each side of the midline are identical to each other, as are the two small subunits. The antibody we have just built would quickly fall apart because it is only loosely connected. Add some strong covalent bonds, called disulfide bonds, to connect the chains. Click a disulfide bond. Each antibody chain has a particular region that forms part of the antigen binding pocket. The structure of these regions varies from antibody to antibody and is therefore called the variable region. Label the variable regions by clicking one. For a given class of antibody, most of the antibody molecule is the same regardless of which antigen that antibody is directed against. This region is called the constant region. We will discuss each of the five classes of antibody shortly. Label the constant regions by clicking one. Each antibody has two antigen binding sites at the ends of the arms of the Y. The variable regions of both the heavy and light chains contribute to the antigen binding site. The shape of the antigen binding site and the shape of the antigenic determinant must match in order to bind. Drag the antibody to its antigenic determinant. While the arms of the antibody interact with the antigen, the stem of the antibody determines all of its other properties, particularly how it reacts with the rest of the immune system. For example, the stem determines whether an antibody remains bound to the B cell as the B cell antigen receptor. 
or whether it can activate complement or act as an opsonin to promote phagocytosis. Drag the antibody to its receptor on the phagocyte. The stem also determines whether an antibody can be joined with another to form a pair, called a dimer, or even a complex of five antibodies, called a pentamer. Finally, the stem determines the traffic pattern for the antibody. Whether it is secreted into blood plasma, or is transported into the lumen of the gut, across the placenta, or into other secretions such as saliva. Click the phagocyte to continue. There are five different classes of antibody, each with a characteristic type of stem. They are called IgM, IgA, IgD, IgG, and IgE. To remember these, just think of the name MADGE. We will examine each of these in turn. When people talk about antibodies, the one they usually mean is IgG. Click each square around the IgG to learn about the antibody. IgG constitutes the largest fraction of circulating antibody. It promotes inactivation or destruction of pathogens and toxins. IgG provides a natural passive immunity to the developing fetus by crossing the placenta from mother to baby. IgG is formed late in the primary immune response and throughout the secondary immune response. These antibodies protect us from being infected a second time by the same pathogen. IgG antibodies are used clinically to artificially transfer immunity from one individual to another. We will return to this topic later. Click each square around the IgM to learn about the antibody. Secreted IgM occurs as a pentamer, giving it 10 antigen binding sites. Because of this structure, IgM is particularly good at binding many antigens together in a small clump and at activating complement. IgM antibodies are the first antibodies secreted in response to a new antigen. IgM monomers stud the surface of B cells where they act as B cell antigen receptors. Click the IgM pentamer to see it bind multiple antigens on the surface of one bacterium. Like the creatures inhabiting a medieval moat, IgA antibodies are exported by the immune system into the secretions that cover mucous membranes. The presence of IgA effectively prevents pathogens from scaling the castle walls and entering the body. Click the crocodile to see where IgA is secreted. IgA is principally secreted into the mucosa of the gastrointestinal system, respiratory system, and genitourinary system. It is also found in the more fluid secretions of saliva, sweat, and tears. Its presence in breast milk allows passive transfer of immunity from mother to baby after birth. Click the gastrointestinal system. Plasma cells that secrete IgA are found just deep to mucous membrane epithelial cells. 
They secrete IgA mostly as dimers, and only these dimers can bind to receptors on the epithelial cells. Binding to these receptors initiates transport of the IgA across the epithelium. Transport involves endocytosis, then transport across the cell, and then exocytosis. The end result is that IgA is moved into the lumen where, like the crocodile, it lurks in the mucus waiting for pathogens or toxins. Click the plasma cell to secrete IgA into the lumen of the gut. Click the plasma cell to repeat the animation. Click the IgA dimer to see a summary. In summary, IgA antibodies are found abundantly in secretions. Indeed, more IgA is produced per day than IgG. Most IgA is secreted as a dimer, but some individual IgAs, called monomers, are found in the plasma. The presence of parasitic worms in the body initiates a complex series of interactions between various parts of the immune system that eventually result in the production of IgE. Key to the production of IgE are a particular type of T-cell called a type 2 helper T-cell and a cytokine these cells produce called interleukin-4. IgE antibodies coat the worm, marking it for attack. Click the worm to coat it with IgE antibodies. See if you can remember which leukocyte is most important for eliminating parasitic worms. Select the correct one. When receptors on eosinophils bind to IgE on the worm, the eosinophils release toxic agents from their granules in an attempt to kill the parasitic worm. Click an eosinophil to see it in action. Click an eosinophil to repeat this animation. Click what's left of the worm to continue. Advances in sanitation in industrialized countries prevent most of us from being infected by parasitic worms. As a result, the only time that IgE is important to us is if we have allergies. While allergies have existed since medieval times and before, they are much more common now, affecting as many as 30% of all adults and 45% of children in westernized countries. For reasons that aren't entirely clear, individuals who are prone to allergies make IgE antibodies directed against innocuous environmental antigens called allergens. Common allergens include chemicals found on pollen and dust mite feces. Click the cook to expose her to an allergen. Flowers for my lady. <laughs> Many of us have experienced this response ourselves. How does this happen? Click the cook's nose. At some point in the past, the cook was exposed to the allergen associated with these flowers. Ever since the first exposure to the allergen, called sensitization, IgE antibodies directed against the allergen have been present in her body, studying the surfaces of her mast cells and basophils. When the cook is exposed again to the same allergen, it binds to the IgE on the mast cell and basophil surfaces. Click the allergen to see what happens when it binds. The binding of allergen to the IgE on the surface of the mast cells causes mast cells to degranulate, 
releasing the contents of their granules. Mast cell granules contain histamine and other inflammatory mediators. Just as in tissue injury, the release of histamine and other inflammatory mediators causes blood vessels to dilate and capillaries to become leaky. Click the arteriole. As a result of leaking capillaries, the cook has a runny nose. Histamine can also activate itch receptors and cause bronchiolar smooth muscle constriction, explaining her watery, itchy eyes and difficulty breathing. Click the bronchiole. Many allergy symptoms can be alleviated by antihistamines. These drugs bind and block histamine receptors. Certain allergens, such as peanuts and bee venom, can cause an allergic reaction that spreads throughout the body. Widespread vasodilation and loss of plasma as it leaks into the tissues results in collapse of the circulatory system, while bronchoconstriction makes it nearly impossible to breathe. This systemic allergic reaction is called anaphylaxis and is a medical emergency. Click IgE to see a summary of its actions. As you've seen, the presence of IgE is a benefit to us because it helps us fight parasitic worms, but it can also be a detriment to us because of its involvement in allergies. The role of IgD is not entirely clear. It is located primarily on the surface of naive B cells along with IgM. Together, these two classes of immunoglobulin act as antigen receptors and participate in activating the B cell. Now that we have looked at each of the five classes of antibody, let's review the major functions of antibodies as a group. Unlike a medieval archer, whose arrows can kill an enemy from a long distance, circulating antibodies do not, by themselves, destroy invaders. Let's summarize how antibodies bring about destruction or inactivation. Click the target to continue. Antibodies work in four general ways, which you can remember by the acronym PLAN. Click the P. First, antibodies acting as opsonins mark pathogens for destruction by phagocytosis. Click the L. Second, antibodies attached to the surface of bacteria initiate the classical pathway of complement activation, which can result in lysis via the membrane attack complex. Click the A. Third, because they have more than one antigen binding site each, antibodies can clump molecules and even entire cells together. Process is called precipitation and agglutination. Clumping enhances phagocytosis. Because IgM pentamers have 10 binding sites, they are particularly good at forming clumps. Click the N. Fourth, antibodies can prevent viruses and toxic molecules, such as tetanus toxin, from interacting with the body's cells. For example, viruses enter our cells by binding to specific receptors. Antibodies can bind to the regions of the virus that interact with these receptors and prevent them from binding to our cells. Antibodies can also bind to enzymes and toxins, interfering with their functions. This process is called neutralization and is the process by which antivenoms work.
The antibodies we have just talked about are only made on demand when they are required. When B cells become activated upon encountering their specific antigen, they divide and form a clone of plasma cells that secrete antibodies and memory cells that are held in reserve. To understand B cell activation, you need to remember three key points. First, B cells respond to extracellular antigens. Second, these antigens are concentrated by the secondary lymphoid organs, such as lymph nodes and spleen, when they are filtered out of the lymph or blood. Third, B and T cells continually circulate and briefly congregate in the secondary lymphoid organs where they can most easily find their antigen and, if necessary, each other. We will now take a closer look at this process by following a B lymphocyte through a lymph node. Click the lymph node to continue. B cells enter the lymph nodes through blood vessels and migrate through the T-cell-rich deep cortex to the outer cortex where B cells predominate. Click the naive B cell in the blood vessel. Here our B cell may encounter its antigen and begin the activation process. Click an antigen. Once the antigen is bound, it is brought into the B cell by endocytosis. Most often the antigen is a protein and is degraded into small fragments. These peptide fragments are then displayed on the surface of the B cell bound to special cell membrane proteins called major histocompatibility complex proteins. We will explore this process in more detail in Topic 6. In most cases, full activation of B cells requires the help of certain T cells called helper T cells. These T cells must already be activated, a process we will discuss in Topic 6. Because T cells are found deeper in the cortex, B cells that have encountered their antigen migrate toward the border of the T cell and B cell regions. Click the B cell. If a helper T cell recognizes the antigenic fragment bound to the MHC, that helper T cell binds to the B cell. Take a moment to marvel at how unlikely this event is, given the vast diversity of receptors among B and T cells. What are the odds that a B cell would ever encounter a matching T cell? While the odds are small, these encounters do occur because their likelihood is improved by bringing these two types of recirculating cells together in special rendezvous spots in secondary lymphoid organs. Click the T-cell. When the helper T-cell receptor successfully binds to the MHC protein bearing the antigen fragment, other cell surface molecules also link up between the B and the T-cell. As a result, cytokines are released from the helper T-cell. Together, these signals complete the activation of the B-cell. Click the T-cell receptor. Note that for full activation of a B-cell, two sequential signals are required. The first is binding of antigen to the B-cell receptor, and the second is the exchange of signals between the helper T-cell and the B-cell. This process is called co-stimulation and acts as a safeguard to prevent inappropriate activation of B-cells. For certain antigens consisting of many repeating units, such as polysaccharides, helper T-cells are not required. This class of antigen is called T-cell independent. Immune responses to this type of antigen are generally weak and may consist only of the IgM class of antibody. As we have seen, the antigen has selected an appropriate B-cell which will now form a clone of effector cells, in this case, antibody-secreting plasma cells and memory cells. Click the activated B cell.
As the B cells begin dividing during the primary immune response, some of them become plasma cells that move deeper into the lymph node and begin to secrete IgM. Click the B cell. Other B cells form centers of proliferation called germinal centers in follicles of the outer cortex. Click the remaining B cell. Under the direction of helper T cells and cytokines, three important things happen to the offspring of the original activated B cell in germinal centers. First, B cells fine-tune their ability to tightly bind antigen by undergoing another round of mutation followed by selection. In this case, B cells compete with each other for the specific antigen displayed by specialized dendritic cells. Only those whose receptors bind most tightly are allowed to survive. This is called affinity maturation and results in antibodies that are highly selective for the antigen. Click a B cell in the top row to see these cells undergo selection during their affinity maturation. Second, depending on the mix of cytokines secreted by helper T cells, B cells switch from producing IgM antibodies to producing IgG, IgA, or IgE antibodies. Click one of the surviving B cells. Third, B cells differentiate into either plasma cells or memory cells. Plasma cells are antibody factories that spew out antibodies at the remarkable rate of 1,000 antibody molecules per second. Memory cells circulate throughout the body and mount a faster, more powerful immune response if they encounter antigen again. Click the remaining B cell to begin its recirculation as a memory B cell. Humoral immunity can be acquired either actively or passively. We'll look at active mechanisms first. Click the box. First, your body can make antibodies in response to an antigen. This is called active immunity and is the process we have just discussed. You can encounter these antigens in one of two ways. Click the naturally acquired box. You constantly encounter antigens naturally as part of your daily life and produce antibodies against those antigens. Click the artificially acquired box. Alternatively, active humoral immunity can be artificially induced by injecting antigens into a person in the form of an immunization. Active immunity generates memory cells and therefore long-lasting immunity to that antigen in both naturally acquired and artificially acquired immunity. Click the humoral immunity box again. Instead of making antibodies, your body can acquire humoral immunity by receiving antibodies from another person. Passive immunity can be acquired either naturally or artificially just like active acquisition of humoral immunity. Click the naturally acquired box. Natural transfer of antibodies occurs from mother to fetus across the placenta during pregnancy and from mother to baby in milk during breastfeeding. Click the artificially acquired box. Artificial transfer of antibodies, commonly called gamma globulins, is used to prevent or treat illnesses against which the body may not be able to mount enough of an immune response. Examples are rabies exposure and hepatitis A. Gamma globulins are also used as antivenoms for snake and spider bites.
Here's a summary of what we've covered. Antibodies are Y-shaped molecules with arms that bind the antigen and with a stem that determines the class of antibody. The five different classes of antibodies, IgG, IgM, IgA, IgE, IgD, each have different functions. Antibodies mark their targets for destruction either by phagocytosis, complement activation, leading in some cases to cell lysis, agglutination, or neutralization. Helper T cells are crucial for activation of B cells in response to most antigens. Affinity maturation, antibody class switching, and differentiation into plasma cells and memory cells occur in the germinal centers after B cell activation. Humoral immunity can be acquired actively or passively. To test your knowledge, click the quiz button to go to the self-quiz. To access cross-references for this topic in your Benjamin Cummings textbook, click here. To test your knowledge, click the quiz button to go to the self-quiz.